This is the third presentation on the future of photography. I promise it's the last one. And we're going to cover three things. One, we're going to show several unique ways to bend silicon to help create the curved sensor. Secondly, we're going to show you kind of a radical uh, lens shade, which is, uh, you know, there's an area that hardly anything's ever been done with, but I think you'll find that interesting. And the last thing we're going to show is how to get more resolution than the pixel count in a sensor. These are the three titles that you will search if you're going to YouTube to see these. And the first one that we shot in 2009 is titled 2014, The Camera Revolution. Then in 2010, we did the second one, which is entitled 2014, The Super Camera. And the third one will be titled 2014, Camera Technology Secrets. Unfortunately, YouTube has limits on how much time you can put up, so they'll be broken up into things. And even if you're watching this on digital, you might go to YouTube and look at these just to make sure that we put up the same stuff so it's all very, very public and we can talk. Let's take a look at what our ears have demanded and technology has delivered and see if that is a good analogy for what our eyes demand in photography and what they are going to be getting. Uh, so I'm going to go with some music. First of all, let's remember what my parents had for music. This was the 78. This was the standard, and there were some problems with it. The problems with it go like this. They break easily. They scratched. They collected dust. But that was the best they had then. Okay, in just a few years, we came up with the 45. Now, the 45 was much more convenient. It didn't break. It was uh, not as sensitive to dust. It only held about three minutes. And uh, interestingly, this became very popular because it was so convenient and pretty soon all popular music was sort of within three minutes uh, and it sort of dictated the way that we, we had music written. Now, uh, we had other things. I mean, it's constant continuance of convenience and pretty soon people wanted, remember the eight tracks? Remember this stuff? Huh? People wanted to be able to play in cars, and so this came along. It got improved when we got to cassettes, and then we got to CDs, and uh, we have gone from Walkmans to iPods in 23 years. Even more convenience, better sound. It's always more and more convenience, better and better sound. Now, what does that have to do with us today? Do you remember this? The Instamatic, when it came out, created more photographers than ever existed before. Even women started to take pictures. And, and in fact, uh, the Instamatic brought convenience to photography for the first time. It was invented by a guy named Dean Peterson at Kodak. I want you to remember that name. That'll become important, Dean Peterson. The Instamatic, created the boom in 35 millimeter sales because these people started taking more and more pictures and pretty soon they weren't satisfied with the quality. So what, you ask? Well, this is so what. We have way more people taking pictures today than ever before through their smartphones. And how long will it be before they get tired of the rather poor quality they're getting in those? So what I'm suggesting is that the superb quality we get in this kind of a seven or eight pound thing to lug around will very soon be coming in this size of a package. Let's understand that in audio and in visual, smaller has nothing to do with quality. In fact, the smaller stuff gets, generally the better the quality, the more convenient it is. Now let's, let's get off the philosophy and let's go to a uh, first thing that I want to divulge to you, and that is a superior lens hood. Now, you need to read or you need to pay attention to the first presentation if you want to understand why digital zoom, which gets better and better as pixel counts get denser, is going to obsolete optical zoom. There's a pretty compelling case made for that happening despite 
attitudes towards digital zoom today. Let's imagine for a moment that this is a digital camera. It's an Instamatic, so use your imaginations. Let's assume that this is a lens hood. Now, let's assume that this camera can zoom from wide angle to telephoto. Here's how it would be wide angle. Here's for a normal perspective shot. And here it is for telephoto, protecting things. Now, why is that important? Well, let me uh, give you an example from my camera, my favorite camera. And <laughs> these will get lighter. They are already. Uh, this picture here, which showed a whale that I shot off the bow of a friend's boat, was really quite good. Uh, but I was shooting it at 400 millimeters. You cannot do that except between 10 and 2 during the day to have enough light because this lens is slow. And that's another problem with optical zoom. It slows down lenses. And you can make up for it with increasing the ISOs, yes, but you also increase noise when you do that. It's just like pushing film used to be. Now, if I were, if I were shooting that at 100, you know, this lens shade is designed for that. But when I go out to 400 and its angle of view compresses and gets narrower, if there had been a sunset right over that whale's tail, it would not be in the picture, but it would be hitting the objective lens, and that's what causes flare. And that's why the idea of having a lens hood that extends when, the focus, when you digitally focus out, and since this the camera determines what angle of perspective you have, so it can also automatically control this so that you don't have the lens hood in the image when it's wide angle, yet blocking some of the stray light. You have it blocking the stray light without being in the image when you're doing medium perspective. And you have it when you're at telephoto and all ranges in between. Pretty simple, huh? Usually the neat things are and nobody's done this. Photography is deteriorating. Leica is a very proud name in photography. Kind of been passed by by the Japanese, but they just came out with a 24 to one zoom, an outrageously long vocal length. So I went down to our local camera store to try it out, see how it works. And I took a shot inside and found fairly good detail. So that was, that was a reasonable shot. It's, uh, it's wide angle, so it's f2.8, which isn't very fast. Then I tried it at a more medium perspective, and you can see it starting to come apart. Um, it's pretty fuzzy in here. Numbers on the wall are not, uh, not readable. And then I went all the way to a full zoom, 24 to 1 zoom, and it really kind of comes apart there. It just shows how, how bad uh, optical zoom gets. And this, this was very slow. Uh, I mean, that was f5.2, I think, when you zoom out. So, you know, available light, that was kind of tough on it. But to be fair, I decided to go outside and give it some real sunlight. So here was the normal shot that I got. That's Nelson Photo, our local village camera shop. And when I zoomed in a little closer, it, it looked, you know, pretty good. Uh, I, ha I, I don't object to that much at all. But again, when you take it all the way out to optical zoom, this is where optical zoom is starting to fall apart. And uh, I think that the uh, inevitable changeover is coming. Look at the first presentation we did in 2009 if you want more detail on that. This is a silicon rod. Solid. And we're talking about curved silicon sensors. The problem with silicon is doesn't bend worth a darn. Now, however, that's true because it's thick. Thin silicon is more easily bent. This is a fiber optic connection. It is silicon inside the jacket, but it's a bunch of very thin silicon fibers. Guess what? The silicon becomes very flexible. You can bend it. You can do a lot of stuff with it. You can tie it in a knot, and it's going to be just fine. Now, the problem, that, that oversimplifies it because why that works is it will work in one direction. You can bend silicon this way, 
you can bend it this way, but when you try to bend it both ways, it just gets pretty tricky and difficult. There, there are ways that we show you in the patents, and you're welcome to see all the filings that show ways around this. But after, after this, I want to show you another way to do it. But first, I want to suggest something else. This is also silicon. It's called fiberglass. And this stuff is really thin. And relax, guys. This is not what you think I'm going to do to you. It's so thin that I'm a little careful about touching it. But look, I mean, we're talking really malleable and stuff that is very fabric-like. So the question arises, I guess I don't need those, is why don't we make sensors out of this? Why don't we weave blankets or maybe even just lay layers uh, threadwise across each other, kind of like plywood, plywood stronger than wood, and use a little heat and a little molding to create curved sensors very easily. That's my question. Do you think it makes sense? That's that. Bend silicon into a curved sensor Let's say on this side, and this is a little too thick for reality. I mean, it does get easier when you get thinner on silicon. But let's say we tried to bend this into a concave shape. This side, let's say, would be the concave side. Let's say it's like that. And what happens when you try to bend it is the very surface here suffers compression. It's being squeezed tighter together. And just the opposite is happening on this side, where the convex side is. And it gets stretched. And that is what causes uh, silicon to fracture when you try to bend it. So here's kind of a, a radical and wild idea that I want to uh, propose to you. There is a way to uh, stop those stress fractures. And it goes something like this. Let's assume that what we do is we coat both sides, both surfaces, and we may find out in lab tests that one surface will do it, but let's just assume two. And then let's hit this with a flash, a very quick flash of heat. What does that do? It heats up this side, it heats up this side, but it does not heat up the middle part because glass is a reasonable insulator, and besides, we're doing this very fast. So once we've done that, then we put it in a mold, and the silicon bends without fracturing. How's that for a wild approach?